Hello, hello, I am the cheap and tippity and slightly criminal version of Lord Hard Thrasher, and after watching part 1 and 2 of his Burma series, a proverbial penny dropped in my exceedingly large and ever so humble brain. That penny, well, not really a penny because we use cents and don't have to play around with some kind of voodoo doll to figure out the cost of eggs every time we go to the shops and with shillings and pennies, we just know we can't afford eggs in this economy. Anyway, this penny reminded me there are some pretty bloody interesting stories and amazing stories throughout history that I know from my extensively book-filled and not very social upbringing that many of you would have either never heard of, or if you have heard of it, it's because you might have just heard a cursory name or something alluding to the topic. I'm of course referring to a bit of Australian history here. With that thought in mind, I toddled over to my bookshelf and opened up a few old books on the Mediterranean theatre during the Second World War, paying particular attention like I normally do to anything vaguely nautical until I came upon the new book that I purchased and never actually read on the Scrap Iron Flotilla by Mike Carlton, a phenomenal Australian naval historian. Given I already knew the history of the ships and their operations, I wasn't expecting to be shocked, but the detail in which he went in this book prompted me to look further, given that I quite literally live literally the throwing distance of a monkey from the Australian War Memorial. I figured I would waddle over and look into the archive, aka I would get on my computer and look at the archive and actually go there if I needed to, to bring you after this horrifically long introduction, in which half of you already clicked off, the tale of the Scrap Iron Flotilla. A couple of really important points before we get started. Now, there are going to be a lot of terms, and I will endeavour to give you all a geography lesson as we get a bit further into this epic tale. First things first, you're going to hear the ship prefixes HMS and HMAS interchangeably as we talk about different ships. HMS means His Majesty's Ship, and it is a prefix carried by all British warships. Similarly, HMAS means His Majesty's Australian Ship. See, one thing you need to note is that Australia is, and well, still to this day, a constitutional monarchy within a federal system. So we have states, parliaments and such, but we do have a monarch still. Now this monarchy today is not the British monarchy, but the Australian monarchy, and it is completely legally separated from the British monarchy. The crown just happens to sit on the same head, namely the head of the House of Windsor. So in the Second World War, after the statutes of Westminster and everything had kicked in, the King of Australia was George VI, hence George's Royal Australian Navy. During the Second World War, Australia was very connected within the Empire, and sailors could and would regularly be transferred in and out of the Royal Navy, the Royal Australian Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, and Royal New Zealand Navy, for example. Ships too would be swapped in and out, and commissioned and decommissioned. So let's keep that in mind when I'm using prefixes such as HMS, HMAS, or even HMNZS. It all makes sense. Another few tidbits. The Axis powers and the French did not use any prefixes, so ship names are just names, like Provence or Caudulio. Foxel means forecastle, or the front of the ship. Aft is the back of the ship. Bridge is the bit where you drive the thing from. Well, most of the time. There's also a control centre and, generally speaking, another wheel at the ship's aft within the engine room, called aft steering. Very intuitive name. Captains did not need to be the rank of captain to be captain. They could be a lieutenant or a commander. A captain is both a position and a rank, so it's not always lining up, so just keep that in mind when I'm referring to lieutenants who are also commanders and such. A knot, by the way, is just a term used to describe the speed of a ship. A knot is about 1.1 miles per hour, or 1.82 kilometers an hour, and a nautical mile is roughly the same conversion. And lastly, I'll be using the imperial measurement of inches to describe gun caliber, as was the standard practice for the Royal Australian Navy at the time. So without further ado, let's get into the storied tale of the Scrap Iron Flotilla. The Mediterranean is one of those aquatic bits of the world that could be argued to have done more for the growth of modern civilization than quite literally anywhere else. It was here that naval warfare in many ways found itself entering the world stage, with the fleets of the ancient world smashing into each other with giant rams. Flash forward a bit, in 1571 it was here that the Holy League, in conjunction with the land battle at Vienna and the previous failure of the nautically transported siege of Malta, crushed the Ottoman plans of expansion at Lepanto. A battle so ferocious, the water turned into a cascade of blood. Now, obviously this is hyperbole, but you get the picture. It was also here in the Mediterranean, over the tumultuous Napoleonic Wars, that the British Royal Navy cemented its position as the ruler of the world's oceans, when, and I will use his full title, 
the most noble Lord Horatio Nelson, Viscount Baron Nelson of the Nile and Burnham Thorpe in the county of Norfolk, Baron Nelson of the Nile and Hilborough in the said county, Knight of the Most Honourable Order of the Bath, Vice Admiral of the White Squadron of the Fleet, Commander in Chief of His Majesty's ships and vessels in the Mediterranean, Duke of Bronte in Sicily, Knight Grand Cross of the Sicilian Order of St. Ferdinand and Merit, Member of the Ottoman Order of the Crescent, Knight Grand Commander of the Order of St. Joachim. Yes, that was a mouthful, but that was Nelson's full title, because it was here in this body of water where Nelson smashed the French fleet at Abakir Bay, also known as the Battle of the Nile. It was therefore at the entrance of the Mediterranean naturally in 1805 where Nelson, who in fact met his end here, would cement the might of the Royal Navy by crushing the Spanish and French lines at the Battle of Trafalgar, just west of the great pillars of Hercules. The Med, as it would be known, truly was the cradle of naval warfare, the great blue blob that began a tale now as old as time, and it was here in 1915 where Australia and New Zealand found their identity not just as a mere colonial outpost, but as a united peoples as Anzacs. Although the campaign in Gallipoli would end in horrific defeat, with disease and death, it would be here that Australia would be set on the path that it is today. So too was it that barely a handful of years later, it was on the shores of this great sea that the Australian light horse charged down a fortified position in an epic showdown between the horsemen and machine guns, breaking open the Ottoman Empire that had stood for centuries at Beersheba and charging all the way to Damascus. The Med, therefore, naturally would be the place where the Royal Australian Navy would find its independent voice in the Second World War, on the backs of its three modern light cruisers, as a part of the Royal Navy's extensive fleet based at Alexandria. But this voice and this new identity, above all, was founded by five old ships. Five old ships that Joseph Goebbels himself called a bunch of scrap iron, and they took what that ghoul said personally. The tale really begins in the 1920s, just following the First World War, where the still very young Royal Australian Navy found itself scuttling its flagship, the battlecruiser HMAS Australia, to comply with the British Empire's terms when it came to the Washington Naval Treaty. This left the country under the protection of only four old, outdated town-class cruisers, one of which was on the slipways as the Depression reared its ugly head. The Navy would attempt to rectify this to an extent, with the purchasing of three modified Leander-class light cruisers the Perth, Sydney and Hobart, in the lead up to the Second World War, along with two county-class heavy cruisers, Australia and Canberra, and modernising the older, less worn HMAS Adelaide. But there was still a big gap when it came to its destroyers. In the interwar years, the Navy had operated a handful of small destroyers and a small flotilla. The HMAS's Tattoo, Stalwart, Success, Swordsman, Tasmania, and the flotilla leader, Anzac. But these were very much of the vintage variety, and in 1933, the Navy would request replacements from the Royal Navy, and they would come in the form of the heroes of our story. The ships were as follows, Waterhern, Vampire, Voyager, Vendetta, and their leader, Stuart. Make no mistakes, these ships were not new, all built to vintage World War I V&W class designs, and serving since. One of these ships had actually fought at the Second Battle of Heligoland Bight during the First World War. Stuart had actually fought with the Royal Navy's intervention force into the Baltic Sea in 1919 to help prop up and ensure the independence of the Baltic states against Bolshevik forces. Stuart and her flotilla would serve out what was supposed to be their twilight years therefore in Australian service, and the idea was that in a few years they would be retired and replaced with new old ships. But Germany had a few other plans. September 1939 therefore found the decommissioned Stuart being towed over from her mothballs in Sydney Harbour to the naval base at Garden Island, being given a new commander, the brilliant Hector Waller, quite possibly one of the best commanders ever produced during this period. Don't quote me on that, that is an opinion held by Admiral Cunningham, who thought incredibly highly of the man. And in short order, Stuart and the mothboard Waterhound were recommissioned together and given their marching orders to join the rest of Flotilla, which was in various stages of commission. This all occurred in a rush because on the 3rd of September 1939, a signal flashed around the world from Whitehall to each of the naval commanders in the Empire, and it was plain and simple. Total Germany. War was back. And for a second time, a group of plucky Australians would be making their way into the Med, the ancient battleground in which sailors from all generations across all of our collective history in the Western world have fought each other. 
This video is actually brought to you by a sponsor. Me! Yes, I have sponsored myself. Because I have made and store. You can buy your favorite cruise line, Tsushima Cruise Lines merchandise for wherever you need it. You can put one on the wall. You can stick it on your laptop. You can have it on a notepad to have that weird teacher in your class try and figure out why you have a boat surrounded by binoculars on your notebook. Tsushima Cruise Lines. Buy it on a shirt. Buy it on a jumper. Be the most fashionable person you can be. Link in the description. On the 4th of October 1939, the Stewart, Waterhern and Vendetta slipped their moorings in Sydney Harbour and instead of the usual turn south to Jarvis Bay, where they were training for the last few months, they swung north, heading towards both Destiny and Singapore with no pomp and circumstance. It was deployment time. At the same time, Vampire and Voyager so too slipped their moorings in Perth over on the other side of Australia and headed north. There was a bit more pomp and circumstance this time as one of the Australian ships found itself under attack being broadsided with rotten tomatoes by ladies of the night for unpaid services rendered. The captains of the ships finding this really quite amusing. Upon hearing the news that the squadron of Australian destroyers were on their way to the Med, the German propaganda machine swung into action. Eager to take a dig, the ghoulish Goebbels made a crack that the Australian ships were nothing more than scrap due to their age and would be dealt with. The thing a lot of us people don't realise though, and somebody should have told old Joe this, when you mock an Australian they're going to adopt it and run with it. Without any hesitation, a little later in their deployment, the crews would find out about this nickname, and they would take on the title themselves, nicknaming themselves the Scrap Iron Flotilla, where we get the name today. The little squadron was woefully ill-prepared for anti-submarine warfare though, and so after plodding north to Singapore, the ships began to train with the Royal Navy's submarine HMS Parthian. On this voyage north, the Stewart's group would spend their entire journey training with the monotony only being broken when a container ship refused to respond to the captain's signal to stop, getting a shot across its bow for its trouble. Once training in Singapore had been completed, the ships were ordered west to join with the British fleet in the Med. Something important that should be mentioned here is that unlike the First World War, where the Royal Australian Navy fell directly under Admiralty command, the ships were still controlled entirely by Canberra, and the Australian War Cabinet and the Prime Minister of Australia had the final say. Their deployment to Singapore, therefore, while requested by London, was only undertaken with express approval from Canberra. With Italy not yet in the war, the Med was seen in the early days as a bit of a backwater, and ships had been taken from the fleet and the region to reinforce the North Sea. And anyway, if the war started in the Med, the French fleet was right there. Retasking to the North Sea was especially needed by the British, given that German submarines were effectively everywhere. There were never enough destroyers and cruisers. In fact, during these early days, the U-47 under the Gunter Preen had snuck into the anchorage at Scarpa Flow and sank the old battleship HMS Royal Oak with tremendous loss of life. The British made the case to the Australians that the odds of German submarines appearing near Australia were pretty low, and the only danger really would come from commerce raiders. The Australians agreed and deployed the modern cruiser HMAS Sydney, along with five destroyers to the Med, to reinforce the British fleet. In response, the British sent two older cruisers out to back up the Australian front. The Prime Minister of Australia and his cabinet weren't all too excited about this. They felt like the British simply didn't understand the threat of Japan to the north, something that was looked on more and more alarmingly as time went on. It was on this voyage that the fleet had a message flashed through that there was a chance the German Panzerschiff, Admiral Graf Spee, was operating in the region and they should be on alert. Captain Waller decided that should the flotilla encounter Graf Spee, they would attempt to either vector bigger and more capable vessels to deal with it, or channeling the spirit of Ragnarok, they would full send it and charge down the ship from every direction, splitting its fire and throwing every single weapon and torpedo aboard at the German ship. The little fleet though would be split up here, with the Stuart, the largest of the five, running south to Madagascar, while the remaining four ships kept heading for the Med. Stuart would run out of fresh food on this voyage, and the crew would have to subside on tinned bully beef, which is about as good as it sounds. Biscuits, spam, and, well, general misery. Stuart would make its way to Madagascar, where it would come into contact with a French sloop and a British cruiser to hunt the spay. This little sidetrack to Madagascar wasn't the most enjoyable experience for the Australians, 
with the only upside being the cheap champagne, which the crew chugged like they were the future Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke at a cricket match. The port's food suppliers, though, seemed to take issue with a boatload of Australians, and instead of actually helping them, they did their best to just be a complete pain in the proverbial. Thankfully, this wasn't a very long side quest, and Stuart, in very short order, headed north. The crew of the Australian ships at this point in history had a certain reputation within the Rider Royal Navy, because the Australian ships were almost always British built, they tended to be built for colder Atlantic and North Sea conditions. So Australian sailors, living in, you know, a hot place, adopted what was called a pirate rig. From the captain down, sailors would often wear shirts, shorts, and even sandals. Captain Hector Waller, commander of the whole division of five ships, was often seen on the bridge of the steward, wearing a cricket hat, a simple short sleeve shirt, and shorts, rocking a pair of dad sandals while smoking a pipe. Back in Singapore, the steward had actually finally gotten a navigation officer, having sailed from Australia without one. A very loud and proud Scotsman, who fit right in, mind you. And he had a giant black bushy beard described as blackbeard-like or piratical. And so, as the steward sailed north with basically no food other than bully beef, the sight of a shark circling the ship became quite alluring. Captain Waller, from the side of his own ship, emptied his revolver into the shark's head and the fish was carved up with its jaw mounted on the forecastle. Also on this voyage, a ship was spotted, and upon seeing the steward, it ignored all signals and turned and ran. A shot across the bows convinced the ship to identify itself, and it came to be known that this was a British ship, and it thought that the steward might be a German. The British ship was quite apologetic, and for the trouble, it sent over a boat full of mutton and other goodies, sending the crew's spirits into the stratosphere. The Australian ships joined together and headed towards Malta, much to the shock of everyone who saw the little fleet, led by Stuart, a ship crewed with men dressed in their best shorts and shirts with giant blackbeard beards, mounting a shark's head on its bow. The Australians had arrived in style to the Med. But first, it's time for a lesson, so alright kids, sit down and listen up because I'm only saying this once, and yes, there will be an exam, and if you fail, I'm going to channel the 1940s, and as my grandfather would say, make you walk 30 miles to school through the snow, even though it doesn't snow in that part of Australia, through fields over a minefield with no shoes on while it's 40 degrees warm, while it's snowing, and if you're late, you get the cane. Good? Got it. Okay. You know, in hindsight, I probably shouldn't threaten to whip you. Some of you might get a bit weird with the comments if I do that. So ignore that. But anyway, this big wet thing here, this is called the Mediterranean Sea. It's big, wet, and full of shipwrecks. This is how it looked in World War II, with Egypt being held by the British Empire. Well, technically it was independent-ish. Kinda, not really, sort of, it's a thing. Britain really controlled it, but it didn't, but it did, but it didn't. The Suez Canal is here, which is really important because it allows for transit in and out of the sea. The other big entrance is over here at Gibraltar, also known as the Pillars of Hercules, which has been a British possession for centuries. Here is French Algeria, more on that later. Over here and here are colonial Italian territories. The port of Bardia is here in Italian Libya, more on that later. Here though, this very small island, it is Malta. It is also a British territory and really, really important for Italian supply lines going to Africa. And here is Cyprus, more on them later. This is Greece and Crete. Again, more on that later. Take a shot every time I say this. This island here, south of Italy, is Sicily. And to the right of it is the Straits of Messina. And that part of Italy there is called Calabria. Very importantly, right there is Toronto, an Italian fleet base. Over here is French-controlled Syria and Lebanon. And over here is the British mandate of Palestine and Jordan. Oh, and over here is the Cape Matapan. More on that later. A couple of points to keep in mind going forward for the next bit is here is Tobruk and here is Al Alamein. I will get into it, but for now this is all you really need to know geography wise. And of course territory will change hands as the war progresses and the Allies beat the ever loving snot out of the Italians. And then in turn get smacked around by the Axis before finally the Allies perform a certified beat down on the Africa Corps. And you know Operation Torch happens and you know stuff happens. but. We'll get to that. Our story doesn't go all the way through to the invasion of Italy. We pretty much end it when Japan gets involved in the war and, spoiler alert, a lot of the Australians decide, hey, maybe we should go back and defend our own country. 
But after 20 or so, or however long it took minutes of waiting, we have finally reached the med. We have finally reached the wall. The experience of the Scrap Iron Flotilla in the early days can really be summed up by the experience of the ships and their first Christmas in the Med. Shortly after their arrival in Malta, the ships would be split up, effectively being the only major destroyer force in the Mediterranean at this point. So empty was the region of, well, ships under the British Crown. Stuart was ordered north to Marseille, and on this voyage she would experience some of the most horrific weather imaginable, with many of the crew convinced that the ship would surely find itself on the bottom. Their Christmas would be marked clearly inside waterlogged cabins and mess decks eating an attempt at a Christmas dinner by the ship's cooks, doing their best to not fall over mid-meal and dump it all on the wet floor. The miserable affair was further heightened by the fact that the powers at be decreed that unlike the Royal Australian Navy's bigger brother, Australian sailors would be forbidden from the daily rum ration, instead making do with cups of tea and extra rations of butter. For Voyager and Vampire, Christmas that early year in 1939 was the complete opposite, having handed off their convoy to Vendetta and Waterhern, who would themselves have Christmases similar to Stuart with a notable exception of the ship's captains permitting a glass of beer each and some cake, Voyager and Vampire meanwhile got to go back to Malta, and the crews would have an absolutely roaring party ashore, feasting on all the pleasantries and drinking well into the night with, um, would you say many ladies. And so this is how their lives would be. Storms and ice in the winter intermixed with the dull boredom of escort duty, tracing their way back and forward across the ancient ocean with regular calls into Haifa, Marseille, Alexandra, and Port Said. The crew all agreed that this was in fact the most boring existence imaginable, intermixed with the sheer misery and terror when old King Neptune decided to smack them six ways from Sunday. There were some bonuses though. The young men who partook universally agreed that the best possible run ashore was either in Malta or Marseille both roaring in equal parts food, booze, and women. Alexandria was okay, but the odds of picking up an unwelcome STD was apparent, and pretty high here, and given the descriptions and the fact that this happened to the first wave of Australians back in the First World War, including a relative of mine, funnily enough, isn't entirely shocking. Universally, it was agreed that Port Said was the most boring place to visit, save for the marketplaces in which you could completely get ripped off or very lucky when it came to buying a camera or other kinds of creature comforts. A few notable exceptions occurred during this period, including one that nearly led to the loss of the Stuart. Stuart was ordered to escort the fleet repair ship HMS Resource, and one evening, on the way to Gibraltar, the ship sailed right into one of the biggest storms seen by the little fleet to date. Out of nowhere, during the storm, they, the ships lost sight of each other, pitching and rolling in the heavy seas. The great hulk of the Resource suddenly would appear, and it came bearing down on the Stuart whose officer of the watch in a flash ordered the ship to hard to starboard to get out of the way, starboard being right, port being left. The steering, though, simply didn't answer, and without even thinking, the young officer ordered the steward full ahead, the ships missing each other by the mere skin of their teeth. Interestingly, Captain Waller had previously served aboard the resource as an officer during a stint on loan to the Royal Navy, and at the time, the officer on the bridge of resource also happened to actually be an Australian by the name of Robert Rankin. Rankin was a star up and comer in the Royal Australian Navy, and was with the British ship to gain experience to fast track him to command. Two years later, in the Pacific, Rankin would be commanding the sloop HMS Yarra, escorting a small convoy when he was attacked by multiple Japanese cruisers. Rankin, in a feat of heroism, along with his crew, would place their ship between the cruisers and the merchantmen, holding them off as long as possible before they all went down with their ship together, only a few survivors coming out of the action becoming a legend in the modern Royal Australian Navy as an example of heroism and resolve. Today, Rankin has an attack submarine of the Collins class named in his honour for this feat. And so, after the little dalliance with the resource, the escorting continued back and forward, back and forward, boredom and misery, horrific storms, all in the middle, runs ashore, breaking up the monotony. But the plucky little ships, although woefully old and outdated, kept up the fight, receiving praise from the commander of the fleet in the Med. Admiral Cunningham, also known as ABC by his initials, noting in his logs that the ships were crewed by some of the most competent and capable men under his command, more than making up for their age and lack of ability. Cunningham would prove this wasn't just a matter of words or puffing up the courage and morale of his ally, because in 1940, 
He placed under the command of Captain Waller, HMS Diamond, Dainty, Decoy and Defender, naming Waller as commander of the 10th Destroyer Flotilla. There could be no mistake now. The Aussies had well and truly arrived into the Med, and it was just in time too. On the 10th of June 1940, Mussolini, and, well, his Italian fascist state, seeing which way the wind was blackly blowing on the continent, and confident of victory, officially joined the Germans in their war against Britain and France, with Mussolini famously declaring that he only needed a few thousand dead to sit at the winner's table. But this was a different Britain. Chamberlain was out, and the Prime Minister was now the old bulldog and staunch anti-appeaser Winston Churchill. Following the fall of France and the evacuation of the British army from Dunkirk, the old politician stood up and put it plainly, we will fight them on the seas and the oceans. We will never surrender. Vendetta would be the first ship to feel this new declaration of war from Italy. Laid up in Malta for repair with her boilers and pieces, she would add to the island's anti-air battery, with her new captain, the young Lieutenant Rodney Rhodes, leading half of his crew in rifle drill, marching around the island preparing to fight Italian paratroopers. Now, for a moment, can you just imagine, just, just for a moment, picture this, close your eyes and picture this. You're an Italian paratrooper. And yet, when you land on Malta, you are met with a man in booty shorts and a t-shirt with a beard like Blackbeard. And he's got a rifle. He's also wearing sandals. He's not wearing boots. He's wearing sandals. This man would not just smile and give you a Vegemite sandwich, but he does in fact come from a land down under. Vendetta would complete her repairs and head for sea. Meanwhile, the other four ships in the squadron were busy bringing in reinforcements. Coming into the Med under escort was the British carrier HMS Glorious and the R-Class battleship HMS Royal Sovereign. The table was now set. The British fleet would be led by HMS Warspite and her sister Malaya and now Ramillies, and Royal Sovereign would join her along with Eagle and Glorious as the assigned carriers. And of course, alongside them, Bob the cruiser HMAS Sydney and the five plucky destroyers of the Scrap Iron Flotilla. It would be their duty to hold the Eastern Med and to assist their French allies, who counted amongst their fleet, two modern battlecruisers, the Dunkirk and Strasbourg, along with the older Corbet and Breton class battleships. The French fleet was indeed immense and incredibly powerful, by far the equal to the Italian fleet in the region, and with the British fleet now there, it seemed like the front would be a bit of a backward front. But it was now history's turn to change everything up yet again. The British fleet left Malta, the bombing was becoming simply too intense to justify staying there, and it made its new home in Alexandria, while the French operated out of Toulon and ports across French Algeria and Tunisia. The Scrap Iron Flotilla would now find itself split between picket duty at Alexandria, search and rescue for downed airmen, and crucially, anti-submarine and mine duty. A lot has been made of the little Italian El Tanket, that cute little thing designed to go up hills quickly. It is a pretty clear indication that the Italian defence budget of three coconuts and a single cup of macaroni wasn't entirely prepared for war on this scale. So in order to try and win the naval war, they decided to spend money on mine-laying submarines. Very specified mine-laying submarines and other craft, such as special forces, similar to the tankette that were designed to do one thing and one thing very well for the war Italy expected was coming. The idea was that these mine-laying submarines and special forces could get into and around Allied ports and attack and destroy Allied vessels and infrastructure. That along with three immense Littorio-class battleships, with which, I'll be honest, look like Ferraris of the naval world because, well, they're just gorgeous. And anyone who disagrees with me on that is just wrong. But at the core of the Italian fleet were still four very old but rebuilt battleships the three new modern Littorios were going to take their time, and amongst the Italian fleet there were no aircraft carriers. The budget of the Italian military was to become painfully aware very quickly. On the 13th of June, while sweeping the region of water just north of Alexandria for a clear path for the fleet's return, Stewart and Voyager found themselves at sea with two British destroyers also under Waller's command. Stewart reported that evening seeing a bright flash on the horizon and rushed towards the location that was supposed to be Voyager. On arriving, Voyager signalled that she had picked up a submarine on sonar and she was hard charging towards where she thought the submarine was. After some misses, she dropped a final pattern of depth charges and everyone manning their sonar and on deck proceeded to hear the catastrophic explosion. 
The Voyager fired illumination flares into the air, and briefly the crew saw a large black hulk surface and then slip beneath the waves. Voyager had given the Australians their first kill, a submarine laying in wait for the fleet's return. The very next day, Voyager came into contact again with another submarine and expended all of her depth charges spotting an immense oil slick on the surface and ratcheting up yet another kill for the plucky little destroyer. Or so they thought. The crews were thrilled and together they all partied hard when they made it back to port. It was only after the war that the Italian Supermarina archives revealed that, although a submarine had been hit there, it had actually managed to limp back to port, cutting the Voyager's kill count back down to one. By the end of June, the Allies had broken the Italian naval codes, and the flotilla put to sea hunting the position of Italian submarines. On the 27th of August, Voyager managed to pick up a ping, and three accompanying British destroyers headed in for the attack. The submarine was the Consul Generale Liuzzi, a young engineer aboard, Gessunio de Montes, I'm sorry for all the Italians, my Italian is not very good, gave his account of the events that would follow, saying that the depth charge attack was incredibly accurate, plunging the boat into darkness and deeper and deeper claiming, in his words, that the attack felt like the end of the world. The Italian captain ordered the submarine surfaced, and somebody waved the white flag from the conning tower. Thirteen Italians found their way aboard Voyager, mostly naked and shivering in the cold with shock. The crew noted very quickly that all the fascist propaganda about the invincible legionnaires and machismo was a complete pile of crap. These were just cold teenagers and young men. The crew made their new prisoners as comfortable as possible, and the Italians prepared for a stint in captivity. Two days later it happened again, just west of Crete, Voyager again sighting a submarine, and the squadron attacked. Again this happened an hour later, barely an hour later a third boat appeared and she was run down by HMS Voyager and HMS Defender, blowing her tanks and surrendering after the destroyers forced her to the surface and hit her with gunfire. The Voyager now made its way back to Alexandria after hunting off three submarines where the celebration was turned up to 11. Remember how I said a lot of Australians weren't allowed rum or alcohol aboard their ships? Well, the Mediterranean fleet and the deployment of these ships started a bit of a tradition, where Australian sailors would somehow vanish to the ships they were tied up next to in port that happened to be British. News would flash through that, for his leadership as divisional commander during this period, Waller would receive the Distinguished Service Order, and the captain of the Voyager, James Morrow, would too likewise. Stuart's ASDIC, Sona, officer would receive the Distinguished Service Cross, and two of the flotilla's other ASDIC operators would receive the Distinguished Service Medal. In all, eight Italian boats would be sunk over these weeks, before the Italians changed their codes, this little flotilla making their impact well and truly known. As effective as the ships were at anti-submarine sweeps and patrols for mines, the crews were getting quite bored. The monotony of war just interrupted with sheer occasional moments of terror as war tends to go. That was about to change though, because having had enough of the cat and mouse game, the Italian fleet was preparing to sortie, and at the head of Cunningham's response was the scrap iron flotilla, being prepared to lead the British fleet into combat. But first, there was a little spy caper straight out of James Bond, and the steward, well, she was to be at the center of it. Back in March, before all Voyager and Stuart submarine shenanigans, the Stuart, Vampire and Voyager docked together in Malta, and the crews noticed a bulletin posted in their messes. It read, Volunteers wanted for a special service operation. For these young men far from home and more than an, a little addicted to having a sense of adventure, this intrigued them, and there was no shortage of volunteers. In the end, 12 were chosen, two officers, Robert Scott from the Stuart and Bill Milne from the Voyager, and the rest were just young seamen and stokers. On the 10th of that month, sailors took their kit bags to the old Fort San Angelo in Malta, where they met with 50 or so of their British comrades, equally in the dark about what exactly they had all just volunteered for. Over the next two weeks, the men were put through a training montage of just the most exhausting physical exercise possible, along with machine gun and rifle and grenade drill. One day, when they were falling in to report on the parade ground, they noted that none other than the commander of the Mediterranean fleet himself, Admiral Cunningham, had marched out to tell them bluntly that they were going on a dangerous mission, that if any of them were found, they would not be claimed. There would be no rescue party, 
and that if they wanted, they could leave now with no shame. Not a single one of the 60 men moved. Every sailor was given three months pay as a bonus and told to go and buy civilian clothes, snappy ones specifically. They were then given new passports and forged Merchant Navy discharge papers. On the 7th of March, a long way from the Med, the SS Mardinian would then set sail from England. A rusty old tramp steamer that looked not at all suspicious or met special or menacing in any way, which is exactly what she needed to be. In her cargo hold were 95 sealed crates that were stamped with the Chrysler Company, and stating that their contents were simply car parts destined for their factory in Budapest. In reality, those crates, while well, they carried four 303 Vickers machine guns, 20 303 rifles, 50 revolvers, 14,000 rounds of 303 ammunition, 10,000 rounds of incendiary ammunition, 1,000 rounds of revolver ammunition, and 49 limpet mines. The ship made its way down the French and Spanish coast into the Med, meeting with HMS Stewart, which had been personally chosen by Cunningham to ferry about 60 men in civilian clothing, including some that the crew recognised as having left the ship recently. The Mardini were then set off east, then north, through the Greek islands, past Gallipoli and Istanbul, and then it would turn north, putting in near Snake Island in the Black Sea at the mouth of the River Danube. The men were on a mission, a mission that included back in London and had been planned by, in company with others of course, none other than Ian Fleming, the writer of the future James Bond himself. Their mission was to sail up the Danube River and close it to German sea traffic, ferrying oil to the Reich from Romania. The mission though wouldn't go well, because although Stuart and the volunteer crews had kept their mouth shut, there were many others who simply did not and one in particular was a British officer assigned to the consulate in Romania, who proceeded to get drunk, swing his revolver around a brothel, and then tell everyone about the mission at a bar. In a country full of German spies who were trying to get Romania into the Axis. The men tried and made it a significant way upriver, but there was only so far bribes could take them. In short order, their weapons were seized, and they were confined aboard their river barges. After paying a hefty bribe to the Romanian government, the men took their riverboats back down the river and some months later sailed them all the way to Athens, where they lashed some small machine guns to them and then they headed towards Alexandria. In one of the few quirks of history, it was none other than HMAS Stuart that they ran into on the way back, arriving almost in one piece back to Alexandria, about six months from when this all began. For his troubles, the British officer, whose name I won't mention, was sent off to New Zealand, where he later, after Ian Fleming died, published a book claiming he was a super spy and James Bond was actually him. Not that he had completely blown any operation or anything. Nobody should bother remembering this moron's name, which is why I won't mention it. As for the men, any evidence of this operation was destroyed and they weren't acknowledged outside of promotion to the next rank that they were in line for. All evidence of this operation now actually comes from either first-hand accounts or some documents scrawled away in an old British dusty archive. There is one other place where you can find some evidence, and that's in the newspapers of the time that talk about sabotage operations in the region. The Italian entry into the war wasn't all that shocking. But what was shocking was the German army's Tour de France being so successful. See, the British fleet in Alexandria was more than a match in the east. But to fight the Italian navy alone, well, that would be a tall order. To fight the French battle fleet under Italian command alongside the Italian one? Now, that would just be impossible. So on the 3rd of July, when the Royal Navy's Force H made its way to Merzel Kabir under the orders to force the demilitarization of the French ships, there was that one thought in mind. This fleet has to be removed as a threat, or it has to be on our side. Although Admiral Dalan and the Vichy French government had promised his fleet would never fall into German or Italian hands, the Royal Navy didn't trust him, because he kept backtracking on everything he said. And they couldn't take that chance. And so, with... What Admiral Somerville and Charger Force H described as the most sickening order possible. And given the French Admiral in charge refused to negotiate, his pride wounded because 
the person sent to negotiate with him because he spoke French was a lower rank than him. Admiral Somerville gave the order, and Force H and the guns of HMS Hood opened up. The French fleet in Mers el Kabir would be smashed, many of their ships sunk, destroyed, or damaged, with many French sailors dying as a result. In Britain, sailors at the time would board French ships at their docks, seizing their vessels with minimal casualties. In Alexandria, meanwhile, the situation was a bit different, because both the ships were in port together, and had they started shooting at each other in port, then, well, it would have been a bloodbath for everyone. Meanwhile, with back with our little fleet, the steward would find itself in a standoff with the much larger French cruiser Du Guetron, with the destroyer's 4.7-inch guns aimed point-blank on the cruiser's bridge, and in turn the cruiser's 6.1-inch guns were aimed right at the destroyer. The tense situation was broken when the Italians started bombing the port, bringing the Allies back together to fight off the Italian air raid. Cunningham was able to negotiate with the French admiral in the port, with him agreeing to disarm his ships and keeping them interned within Alexandria. In 1943, this French squadron, including a battleship and multiple cruisers, would actually return to the fight under the flag of the Free French Navy. Operation Catapult, as the destruction of the French fleet would be known, was a truly horrific event. It made, according to first-hand accounts, many British officers sick where they stood, having to carry out their orders. But it sent a shockwave around the world that the Royal Navy would never surrender. No matter what it would face, it would fight until the very end. With no French fleet, the Italian Navy would therefore become bolder, and Mussolini egged on his generals with orders to advance into Egypt and capture Suez, rebuilding his plaything idea of a Roman Empire. Cunningham knew that he too would have to get more proactive, and he sent out Admiral Tovey, including the Australian cruiser Sydney and Stuart, with part of her division to bombard the Italian port of Bardia. This would become a very common occurrence. The Italian fleet would then put to sea and make a run to Libya protecting a convoy of tanks and soldiers. Cunningham launched his ships at the same time, with a scrap iron flotilla and Stuart at the head of the fleet charging west. The British fleet comprised of three battleships, a carrier, five light cruisers and 16 destroyers, and it was sent right on a collision course with two Italian battleships, six heavy cruisers, eight light cruisers and 16 destroyers. Admiral Campioni was naturally quite concerned about getting into gun range with the British, his warships having much smaller caliber weapons when compared to the British counterparts. After what seemed like days and days and days at sea, with no contact spotted, aero reconnaissance failing, the British cruiser Neptune flashed a signal that hadn't been heard in the Med since the days of the Age of Nelson, enemy battle fleet in sight. The chase was on. At first, the HMS Eagle, the aircraft carrier, would attempt to launch an airstrike, but all the torpedo bombers, the old swordfish, would miss, and the cruisers and destroyers in the British fleet would then swing ahead at full speed, unleashing their guns at maximum range, with many of their shells falling short. As the War Spite and the battleships surged forward, the War Spite outrunning the slower other ships in its fleet. The Italians held the range, hoping that the Italian Air Force would arrive to even the odds. As the War Spite surged forward, she became more and more isolated though from the main fleet, being just that little bit faster than every other British battleship there. The cruiser and destroyer force, meanwhile together, was unloading every single gun that could fire, that was even remotely enraged into the Italian ships. Admiral Campioni decided to take on the isolated War Spite alone, noting that she was pretty well by herself at this point. The War Spite in turn split its fire with its eight large 15-inch guns between the two Italian ships. The Italians meanwhile began firing their 20 10 apiece 12-inch guns, straddling the War Spite, which responded in kind very, very quickly with accurate fire straddling the Julio Cesar and landing a 15-inch shell right onto the deck near the funnel, making one of the longest-range gunnery shots at sea in history, crippling her speed and causing the Italian battleship to just belch smoke. The Italian Air Force would arrive during this engagement, but in a largely stereotypically Italian fashion for the war, it bombed both fleets, somehow missing the giant red and white stripes on the Italian ships. Campioni, seeing that one of his two capital ships was already damaged and losing speed, as the fire caused by Warspite's shell was sucking smoke into the air intakes into the engine room and shutting down the boilers, Campioni ordered his destroyers to lay a smoke screen 
and he fled, disappearing deeper and deeper into the Straits of Messina. First-hand accounts from the Australian destroyers state at this time that they were pursuing the Italians so deeply into their own waters that on both sides of the ships, they could clearly see the Italian mainland. Cunningham gave the order to break off and end the battle, fearing a submarine ambush or a torpedo ambush from smaller vessels, and of course, the mines that were everywhere across the Mediterranean Sea. The British fleet would slowly make its way back to port, the Italian admiral finding himself shaken and his fleet likely damaged, and the battle overall inconclusive. But the first clash of the two fleets had finally happened. After Calabria, it became very clear that there would be a future not of just monotonous convoy duty anymore, but that things were in fact heating up in the Med, that it was only a matter of time until the two fleets would again meet. At the very centre of the action, every time the fleet sailed, would be the five plucky destroyers punching well above their weight. I've decided to cut this into two parts, mostly because this was going to originally be a 15 minute video, and it is now roughly a 14,000 word, yes, 14,000 word, video plan. This one being about half of that. So like, comment, subscribe, thank you patrons, and I'll catch you all in a little bit with part two, where we cover the Battle of Matapan and the Siege of Tobruk, where the Scrap Iron Flotilla would go from a story of highly competent and dependable destroyers to legends in Australian history.